Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Juba by South Sudan's presidential spokesman, Ateni Wek Ateni. Also in Juba is Reverend James Ninru, the executive director of the NGO Assistance Mission for Africa. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. James, let me start with you. Thank you. There's a peace deal. We have the UN envoy, David Shearer, saying fighting has diminished greatly and he is encouraged by a number of positive things. Do you agree with that? Yes, I think I agree because if we compare this month, last year, uh, with this time, there's a great difference. Uh, first of all, the gun has not gone silent, but it has reduced uh, totally into just a spotlight in some places. Right. Ateni Wekateni, good to have you on the program again. Now, Shera, when he was giving the figures, he said... The number of people at UN sites to protect themselves, those who fled to these UN sites to flee violence and rape and so on, has dropped from 205,000 to 193,000. Now, for me, that looks like the UN envoy is a glass half full guy because both numbers are still hovering around the 200,000 mark. Is it good enough for you, Mr. Atene? Uh, in, in actual fact, um, whatever positive um, thing that happened is always appreciated, no matter how small is it. So uh, that is a significant uh, uh, drop in uh, the number of those who are actually seeking protections at the uh, UN protection sites. Uh, it, it is continued to be high. And we will work to ensure that, you know, uh, the people who are in the protection site comes out and, uh, and, and melt into a, a civil population as it is their right as citizen of this country to be with their brothers and sisters outside in the state of just being um, a coach inside a camp that, that is called protection site. Ateni, when will people finally be allowed to go home in safety? Give me a timeline. No, even now it's safe for them to be out. Uh, maybe some individual now wanted to continue simply because uh, UN protection side is still providing, uh, you know, uh, aid assistance and uh, food uh, to number of families that uh, might uh, not be secure outside, uh, you know, uh, food-wise if they are to come out from the, the camp. So, so you, you mean, you see, see that, you know, there are people reluctant to go outside because there is something that will hunt them down as, you know, uh, the fighting has reduced um, in many places. With the exception of those, small, you know, small, small pockets of uh, resistance that are still being, you know, witnessed around Equatoria. And, and that are the, the forces of, uh, of, uh, of Thomas Rillo. So, so the country is, in, you know, is, is better calmed. And, and it is safe for anybody to come outside from the protection site. James, I want to ask you a big quick picture question about the international interest in what's going on in South Sudan. When South Sudan decided to become an independent country, all eyes were on South Sudan, and you couldn't miss South Sudan when you looked at TV channels, when you looked at newspapers and so on. Now when we look at the death toll, solid independent figures coming out showing that the death toll over the civil war has been almost 400,000 people. That's Syria levels of deaths. And South Sudan has a much smaller population. <laughs> Yet despite that, there hasn't been a whole lot of media coverage of your country. Tell me why. The international community interest towards South Sudan has dropped simply because it has gone contrary to what was expected after the independence. The slogan that we uh, use when we were fighting the war is that we want to be liberated, we want to rule ourselves, we want to be in our own country. But after getting the independence, there were no formula that was put in place on how to achieve that big dream. Let's go to Nairobi now and bring in Saif Magango. He's Amnesty International's Deputy Regional Director for East Africa. Saif, do you agree with the premise that there isn't enough attention on South Sudan, even though civil war continues to rage? 
Well, it's actually a good thing that you, you asked that question, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's not uh, entirely true that South Sudan has there's lack of interest in South Sudan. The whole world is trying to resolve the problems in South Sudan. But you can imagine there is a lot of frustration as a result of South Sudan's leadership failing to, uh, to hold people accountable, those who have committed crimes, um, grave crimes under international law, people who have, with victims still sitting in, in, in POC camps in Juba, Malakal, Bentu, and other places, and no clear plan being shown to, to try and um, hold those who put them in this situation, uh, uh, hold them to account, and for them to have justice and redress. Mm -hmm. You're showing pictures at the moment of people getting food aid from international organizations. That is evidence that the world is trying to support the people of, so people of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, the regional countries have tried to mediate uh, a peaceful resolution to the conflicts. Uh, Many, many agreements have been violated and killings have continued. Sexual violence has continued. Up to this day, we're still hearing stories of people, uh, people who have been displaced by violence, uh, suffering and not getting help. And we are hearing stories of even um, different sides uh, continuing to arm themselves and to recruit soldier fighters. So the world is trying to help, but it seems not to have a, a willing and a willing partner on the other right. side. Okay, so let's ask the presidential spokesman. Ateni Wekateni, does the man have a point from Amnesty that there's a lack of accountability, especially since when we look at the crimes committed, major allegations, mass rapes, people being burnt alive, uh, mass killings, you know, on an unimaginable scale, sexual violence that is incomparable to anywhere else on the planet right now, it's not only Machar's forces or other dissident rebel groups and other offshoots, but also strong, credible claims that the SSPDF are doing this as well, and there's no accountability for it. Uh, first of all, uh, to uh, begin with, as to why uh, South Sudan is not uh, on the news spot uh, after the civil war has actually started, uh, compared to uh, when it was gaining independence. Uh, the questions... Uh, you know, poses itself as to to, uh, to whether uh, the international community interest in South Sudan during the independence and the international community interest in South Sudan when the civil war erupted are different or are still is or, or they are still the same. Um, when you look at uh, uh, why South Sudan is not in the news, it is the international community to answer this. Because uh, uh, looking at me as, as also a victim, because I'm a victim of this war, as a, as a, as a member of government of South Sudan, and, um, and, and if, if I tell you that uh, South Sudan is not in the news simply because of one, two, three, it, it might not be acceptable to you. But what, I, what I'm, I'm seeing on this is that um, uh, South Sudan has, has done well uh, uh, after the peace agreement has been signed, and all the parties now seems to have accepted, you know, to uh, for a peaceful, uh, you know, resolution to the conflict. Uh, uh, you know, with the exception of few individuals that are actually remaining outside the peace agreement, uh, things are going to be better for South Sudan. And I think South Sudan will go back to the international focus because right. uh, the same potential potential that was seen to be, uh, you know, uh, existed in South Sudan uh, are going to come back since there is going to be uh, no war. Uh, in okay, so At Ateni, let me let me ask that question again, and I'm glad that you you answered what was addressed a little bit earlier by the other guests. But I want to ask what I asked you specifically again with some statistics, right? So when we look at how this civil war has specifically affected women in South Sudan, South Sudan, 80% of the refugees and internally displaced people are women and children. 75% of girls are not enrolled in primary school. More than 50% are married before the age of 18. 58% of households reportedly female-headed. More than 19,000 children are estimated to have been recruited into armed groups, according to UNICEF, right? And we also have reports of the use of child soldiers, mass rapes, and indiscriminate attacks not only being done by the rebel groups, but also by the South Sudan People's Defense Force, the SSPDF. 
your government's forces. So I go again and I look at how this is playing out for the people on the ground. Yes, there might be a peace deal amongst the two big figures that's relatively holding and we're looking forward to Machar coming back. But on the ground, can you honestly tell me that South Sudan is a safe place, especially for its women and children? as the presidential spokesman. Yeah, uh, South Sudan is safe uh, more than any other time uh, since the start of war uh, in 2013. Um, you know, uh, when, when, when you look at, at any war, uh, the, 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 the much affected population is uh, the women and the children. There's no doubt about that. But when you, when you look at the way, you know, the news are covered uh, about South Sudan, uh, there is a bit of exaggeration on, on many things. Why would they yes, need to exaggerate? Yes, we do uh, acknowledge. Yeah, we need... I think there is an agenda that but, has not yet why, been actually found as to... But what is the agenda? Why would they need uh, to blame the government forces as well? Well, uh, uh, when, when you look at the way the news are covered, it is like much of the, uh, the news me of, the, of the media agencies are just interested uh, when, when, it, when a case is about uh, something negative. But when it is a positive thing that is done by the government, they don't, they don't seem Certainly, to cover but, it. I mean, simply sir, this because is, they are... It's clearly, it's clearly a problem when there's mass rapes and mass killings, and that's why we want to cover it, right? It's not that we're you know, just choosing you know, to cover you know, it. My, you know, mass... It overwhelms mass rape, and overrides a good news not, story, not, doesn't it? Mass, mass rape, mass rape is, not, is not true, because, you know, our <laughs> cultures in South Sudan... Uh, prohibited rapes. The UN and the yeah, US State Department have reported that all sides in the there conflict, be... including the National Army and the SSPDF, have yeah, used not... child soldiers, mass rapes of I'm women not, and girls, indiscriminate attacks. In Unity I'm State, not... April, May 2018, 125 women were raped, at least 125, in Bentiu in Unity State in November. The victim said they were armed men in military uniform. Now, we're not doing that with an agenda because we want to make you look bad. We're doing it because this is serious, right? And clearly, you don't want this to happen in your country, do you? You know, we are a country that actually emerged uh, from the uh, long uh, years of uh, civil war, that, that, that actually uh, a war of liberation that has culminated into the independent of the Republic of South Sudan. We were not given free of charge. And during the time we were fighting in the liberation, we even killed or, or even if execute those who actually uh, uh, actually uh, 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 rapes women. I am not denying the fact that there are a few, you know, individuals who still take mm -hmm. law into their own hand. But uh, should that thing comes to um, uh, to, uh, to 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 us to know, we will take them to to the book. Okay. Okay. But, but so, when you okay, look so at, at some of these, uh, okay, news, so you're saying there's accountability if it happens and when it happens, but it's happening on a smaller yeah, scale. Of course. Unfortunately, we've lost Reverend James Ninru. It's his Skype connection. He's dropped out. We don't have much time, so I want to bring in <coughs> Safe Magango. Safe, you've heard me converse now with Ateni Wek, Ateni, over the past few minutes. He's saying there is accountability and they're doing their best and things are moving forward. Do you agree with that? Well, no, no not at all. I think the only case we've seen where there's been some accountability is the terrain case where soldiers uh, broke into um, a hotel where uh, uh, aid workers were and raped them and killed a journalist. I think we had convictions in those cases last year. But beyond that, we haven't seen any tangible steps to, to bring people who are perpetrators of violence and human rights violations on a grand scale to court. Um, what is, and what we've seen instead has been an onslaught on people who are calling for justice, uh, human rights actors, human rights organizations, um, and, and other, uh, other dissidents, people who's, who are trying to call on the government to do the right thing. As we speak today, uh, you know the case of uh, Peter Biar, uh, a gentleman who has, was trying to yes. advocate for, uh, for responsible leadership, calling for a new generation of leaders and talking about about accountability and all, all those kinds of things. He's now spent six months in detention. Right. Arbitrarily, he's not, he's not being brought to court. Okay, I, okay uh, so family, you know what, listen, this is a good point. Is. Safe, let me allow, allow me to come in here, right? I'm gonna ask my producer for extra time here because I think this is important. Atini Wekateni, so we have the case of Peter B.R. Ajak. Cambridge and Harvard educated for those who want to know completed a PhD in politics at Trinity College in Cambridge. 
imprisoned in South Sudan in July. He doesn't know why, his lawyer doesn't know why. They assume it's because of a tweet criticizing the government. It was in apparent retaliation for his activism on Twitter. Not been formally charged. Legal counsel reportedly been informed that he's accused of both terrorism and treason and being held in the Blue House at the head headquarters of the National Intelligence and Security Service. Apparently, that's a place where torture happens. Is the detention of Peter B.R. Ajak justified, sir? Uh, to be honest with you, so that, you know, say if uh, Maganga doesn't go away with uh, the fact that, you know, uh, during the terrain uh, incident, uh, soldiers were actually brought to book. And there are now people actually facing justice, facing uh, long terms, you know, uh, in jails. Um, he did not know that, you know, uh, the case was actually settled. Uh, it happened that when the individual soldiers took the, you know, the law into their own hand. Uh, coming to issue of Peter Biarajak, uh, Peter Ajak, Biarajak is now under investigation, and I cannot speak about the case that uh, is uh, under investigation. And, uh, and South Sudan is a country that has laws and has uh, institution that um, uh, uh, you know uh, detain uh, people like any other country. Uh, pending, uh, so, you know, okay, uh, the, the Tenney, is it normal the for case? you that is it normal for you that he was detained in July? There's still no charge, and no real access to the outside world. And the last thing he did was criticize the government on social media. Does that seem around that, about fair to you? That that, that is assumption. Okay, I'm stating the facts just, because we don't know. You can just assume anything. Yeah, certainly, I'm stating the you facts. You can just assume know. anything. You you cannot, you can just assume, even in the, the Turkey where you are, there are people locked up, more than 100 of thousand are in prison because of the, the coup, that actually of the failed coup. So, so you, you have not um, uh, come to the point of, uh, of, of talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you, if you talk about the people that are, okay, are, are I ask you about, behind the jail. Okay, I ask you about Peter B.R. Ajak oh. detained without charge or trial, and you tell me about the failed coup said, from 2016. Okay, okay. I expected, a, I, yeah, I expected a bit better, but all right. Listen, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's uh, important to us to continue to cover South Sudan, and we will no doubt cover South Sudan again very soon. And I hope to have you back on the show. Ateni Wekateni and Saif Magango, and earlier Reverend James Nenru. Thanks so much for joining us.